And that is why this lecture series was started, to pay tribute to Raphael Salas, to discuss new and bold ideas, knowing that even if we cannot agree and reach consensus, we need to have the dedicated time and space for robust dialogue and fresh ideas. This year's is an especially exciting lineup. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our distinguished guests present today. Her Royal Highness, Crown Princess Mary of Denmark, patron of UNFPA, welcome. Dr. Natalia Kanem, Executive Director of UNFPA, always good to see you. Our esteemed lecturer this year, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwiyala, the Director General of the World Trade Organization, and how exciting is that? <laughs> and Ambassador Carmelita R. Salas, widow of Mr. Rafael M. Salas and former ambassador of the Philippines to the Czech Republic, who deserves so much credit for helping to keep the legacy of Rafael Salas alive. Okay, so today's lecture will have two parts. First, we will have introductory remarks followed by the lecture by Dr. Okonjo Iwiyala. That will be followed by an interactive discussion with Dr. Okonjo Iwiyala, and we look forward to your questions and comments. So engage, start thinking about those. There will definitely be an opportunity for a roving microphone to find your hand and your voice. Now, it is my honor to give the floor to the Executive Director of UNFPA, who's chatting to her old friend from Harvard. Come up here, Dr. Natalia Kanem, to deliver her opening remarks. Thank you so much, Sherwin, for bringing the excellence we appreciate. Your Royal Highness, Crown Princess Mary of Denmark, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo-Iweala, Director General of the World Trade Organization, Ambassador Carmelita Mentusalas, Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, dear friends, dear young people, thank you. Thank you for joining us for this 18th Rafael Salas Memorial Lecture, honoring the memory and the legacy of UNFPA's founding executive director. Your Royal Highness, we are so glad that you could be with us today in person. We appreciate your passionate advocacy as patron of UNFPA. Yes, Rafael Salas stands as a visionary operating at a time when many leaders and politicians were reluctant to discuss family planning and other population issues. When UNFPA began operations in 1969, world population was under 4 billion and fertility rates worldwide were about double what they are today. There was a global panic about overpopulation and concerns in the media and elsewhere about potential widespread food insecurity and environmental impact. What Mr. Salas did was to urge countries to look beyond the numbers, quote, interest in population is not a concern with the figures on a chart or the curves of a graph alone however important they may be, but is essentially an involvement with the future of humanity itself, he said. Today, the world stands poised to reach a population of 8 billion in mid-November. This milestone is in many ways a moment for celebration. We've reduced poverty and achieved incredible advances in healthcare infant and maternal mortality have declined, and people are living longer and healthier than at any other time in human history. It's also a moment that calls for action, solidarity, and a consensus to find solutions to the challenges the world faces, from COVID to conflict to climate change to food insecurity, poverty, and I have to add the unrelenting pushback on women's rights. We can only tackle these challenges if we work together, beginning with people-centered population policies, with sexual and reproductive health and rights at their core, something that Mr. Salas knew from the very beginning. Through national programs that he and UNFPA championed, 
reproductive choices became a reality for more and more women, especially in developing countries. Millions finally gained the power to decide whether, when, and how often to become pregnant. Today, demographic diversity is the current world reality, with sweeping implications for societies and economies, with low fertility and aging in some countries, and with rapid population growth in others. Unfortunately, we know from experience that population concerns, whether about a population boom or a population bust, too often devolve into fights over women's bodies and attempts to undermine their rights and agency. UNFPA encourages governments to confront demographic challenges not through fewer choices, but rather through more options. We want every girl to be able to stay in school and gain the skills that she needs to succeed. We want her parents to be able to have the number of children they want and can support. And we want her mother to receive the care she needs to survive childbirth, to give birth safely. And we want every young person to be educated and empowered and employed. And this makes it so important that we have the right policies to reduce discrimination and create the conditions for more inclusive growth. And a globalization that works for everyone, leaving no one behind. Trade is, of course, central to this equation, given its potential as an engine of growth to create new jobs, to expand women's role in the economy, and to help reduce inequality. With greater and more equitable investments in human capital, eight billion people could mean infinite possibilities for building the more just, equitable, and sustainable future that we all want. Today, how fortunate we are, and you are in for a treat, to have as the 2022 Salas Memorial Lecturer, someone who is uniquely positioned to reflect upon the role of trade in improving the lives of girls and women. Dear Ngozi, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo-Iweala is the Director General of the World Trade Organization, and she is the first woman to hold this position. She's also the first African to hold this position, and I hope that she will tell us a little bit about the many firsts during her journey, which I've had the pleasure to share. She and I met as university mates, and I have to tell you that even at that young teenage when we met, she was the smartest person in the room, but she was the kindest person in the room. <laughs> Sincere, thoughtful, and I think as a woman who has led as a Minister of Finance, as a Minister of Foreign Affairs, she's also defended ordinary women's right to be able to raise their family in safety and in dignity, and we really appreciate her efforts now in this very contentious and important position of leadership. Her book about leadership, women's leadership, is a must read for everyone. So Ngozi, thank you for accepting our invitation to speak today. I know how much in demand you are <laughs> during this UNGA week, and we look forward to engaging in your very uh, important and thought-provoking discussion. Thank you very much. I thank Dr. Kanem for those opening remarks, and I do have one question. Who was the second smartest person in the room? <laughs> I am now delighted uh, to introduce the remarks by Ambassador Karmelita Salas. Please join me up here. Your Royal Highness, Princess Mary of Denmark, um, Dr. Natalia Ganem, Director General Iweala. It is a singular honor for me and indeed a pleasure to be here at the 18th Rafael M. Salas Memorial Lecture.
Many here are probably asking, who is Rafael Salas? The, sec the, um, ten the, press no, the uh, Secretary of Labor of the Philippines would say he was a warrior who planned his battles well, a poet, a dreamer, a thinker, a humanitarian, and a super achiever. United Nations Secretary General Javier Perez de Cuellar would speak of the footsteps of a man of enduring achievements. From my vantage point, I saw these footsteps to be defined by an uncompromising and unwavering commitment to public service. Um, the discipline of study, remarkable organizing skills, and innate capacity to relate to people, all these put power within Rafael's reach. But to him, power was to be used solely for the common good. For those who knew him well, it is his rat laughter that they re would remember most. It was, in the words of a foreign long-time foreign secretary of the Philippines, a friar's laugh, booming and infectious. <laughs> the laughter of a man completely at ease with himself and with the world. Um, at his final homecoming, at the Chapel of the Holy Sacrifice at the University of the Philippines, I read a quote from Antoine de Santa Exupéry, that author who gave us the gem, The Little Prince. Bit by bit, we begin to realize we will never again hear the laughter of our friend. <laughs> that this garden is locked against us forever. It has been 35 years since that day. And time and time again, I'm reminded that this, lo this garden is not locked against us. On a day like this, when the lecture is honored by the participation of Her Royal Highness, or by the Director General of the World Trade Organization, or when I walk the 321 hectare park at the foot of Mount Canlaon, when I think and look at, in awe at every shoot that becomes a tree reaching for the stars in this place which has been named after his death, the Rafael M. Salas Parks and Nature Center or at the opening of the Nairobi summit, when the UNFA director says, we will not retreat, we will never give up. It's a war we will take to the finish line and we shall prevail. Natalia, my sons join me in congratulating you for the and your wonderful staff for the funds achievement, in recognition of which the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has reappointed you to a second term. My sons and I express profound gratitude that you keep, you are, you are committed to keeping the lecture series uninterrupted. Thank you. I thank Ambassador Salas for her address and for that lovely reflection on the lecture and her late husband. I would like now to introduce our lecturer, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Ibuyala, the Director General of the World Trade Organization. Bear with us, Doc. I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read some of your achievements. I know how that makes people feel. Dr. Okonjo Ibuyala will deliver the lecture entitled The Role of Trade in Improving the Lives of Girls and Women. Dr. Okonjo Ibuyala is no doubt well known to all of you, but a quick recap of her CV is a reminder of how fortunate we are to have her as this year's lecturer. She is the seventh Director General of the WTO and the first woman and first African to hold the position in its 75-year history of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade and the World Trade Organization. Dr. Okonjo Biala is an economist and an international development expert with over 40 years experience. She previously served as the African Union COVID-19 Special Envoy as well as the WHO COVID-19 Special Envoy in 2020. She was one of the founders of the COVAX facility designed to get affordable vaccines to low and middle income countries. Dr. Okonjo Biala was Nigeria's first female and longest serving finance minister. During her tenure, she implemented policy and institutional reforms to help fight corruption. She was also the first female foreign minister. She spent a 25 year career at the World Bank rising to the number two position of managing director operations. 
In 2021, for the second time in her career, Dr. Konja Iwiala was named one of the Time magazine's 100 most influential people in the world. I think I was on the red carpet the first time you got that award. Stuck a microphone in your face, but I'm sure you don't remember me. <laughs> she holds a Bachelor in Economics from Harvard University, magna cum laude, and a PhD in Regional Economics and Development from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. With that, I'm delighted to invite Dr. Konja Iwiala to deliver the 18th Raphael M. Salas Lecture. Well, thank you very much, Sherwin. It's always painful to listen to one's biography <laughs> because it, it, most of the time it doesn't sound like you. But there's one important part you didn't mention. I'm a mother of four children. <laughs> Your Royal Highness, Crown Princess Mary of Denmark, my dearest sister, Dr. Natalia Kanem, Ambassador Kamelita Salas, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm both delighted and humbled to be here with you today I want to start by thanking Natalia and the UNFPA team for honoring me with this invitation. Unlike many who have, may have preceded me at this podium, I did not know Rafael Salas personally, but he was an inspiration to many people I know and admire, and we've heard something of his background from his wonderful wife. So again, it's an honor to be asked to do this lecture today. I'm also here because there is no way that Natalia will ask me to do something and I'll get out of it. <laughs> so it's as simple as that. She was too kind about being smart in, in, in university, but if I can tell you something, there was always one person who lifted us up as we were un undergraduates at, at Harvard. When the going was tough, she was always there pushing, hopeful, and um, she's a lovely sister. I'm also here for another reason that even Natalia does not know. My father, Professor Chukuko Konjo, was a mathematical economist and a demographer. He founded the first Center for Population Studies in Nigeria with the support of Professor Caldwell of Australia, who is one of the world's most famous demographers. And he probably knew uh, um, Rafael Salas. I, I can't imagine that they would not have known each other. So I'm also doing this for, for him because he would have loved the fact that we're here at UNFPA today. He died three years ago. <laughs> this afternoon, I want to discuss the role of trade in improving the lives of girls and women. As far as I can tell, Paeng, I hope I said it well, Salas's remarkable career did not intersect much with trade policy, except to the extent that his successful efforts to help Filipino farmers boost rice yields in the 1960s were motivated in part by the desire to reduce import dependence. But I suspect Mr. Population, as he came to be known, would have supported the idea of people-centered trade as a tool for gender equality. By every account, and we've heard it, he was a man ahead of his time. In an era when supporters of population planning tended to fixate on numerical targets, as Natalia said, with little regard for how policies might have unintended consequences, he insisted that people had to be at the center of population programs. The point he emphasized was to improve people's lives, and he recognized that population policy uh, meant empowering women and girls through not only family planning and health services, but also through education and labor force participation. Women, he wrote, and I quote, must become active participants in the decisions which will profoundly affect their lives, unquote. This is what empowerment is all about, being able to choose and to make decisions for oneself. I was impressed to learn that under his leadership during the mid-1970s, mid 40% of UNFPA professionals were women. 
and its executive level was majority female. I can assure you that most multilateral organizations were not even there in the mid-1980s. Today, I want to use this lecture to highlight a few points. First, global trade, however you might imagine it, uh, maligned in some quarters, has been and remains a powerful instrument for improving the lives of girls and women around the world, and especially in poor countries. But I'll also make the case that we have much left of this power unharnessed. We can do so much more to leverage trade to create economic opportunities for women. And empowering women economically through decent jobs and trade can lead to increased global development and economic growth. Something we desperately need today as we recover from the pandemic and weather climate change and the war in Ukraine. Decades of evidence from dozens of countries underscore the link to the UNFPA's work. When women have a stronger voice within the household, they have more control over the number, timing, and upbringing of children. And it takes only a very quick glance at an SDG map to realize that shortfalls on maternal and child mortality tend to be strongly correlated with low national incomes, though they are outliers in both directions. I hope to persuade you today that trade has a role on both of these fronts. First, as a direct means for creating jobs and market opportunities for women and the businesses they run. And second, as a driver of economy-wide growth in the countries that most urgently need it. This is why the international community must not lose sight of trade policy, even as we seemingly face new crises every day, whether in the economy, the environment, public health, or international security. I should be clear that this is not an either or matter. Trade can help us respond to many of these other crises, even as we use it to enhance gender inclusion. In my remarks today, I'll focus on four issues. First, and even though I know I'm preaching to the choir here, I'll look back at why women's economic empowerment matters. Second, I'll look at trade as a vehicle for creating more and better jobs for women and with far-reaching implications. Third, I will look at the gaps that hold women back from participating in the economy and at how the COVID-19 pandemic has made many of them worse. And finally, I will look at what we can do to maximize trade's contribution to gender equality. In her classic treatise on women and society, The Second Sex, the French philosopher Simone de Beauvoir wrote, and I quote, it is through work that woman has been able to narrow the gap separating her from men. Work alone can guarantee her real freedom, unquote. When women engage in paid work, it can be transformative for them, for their families and their communities and for entire societies. Women's hard work within the home, cooking, cleaning, child and elder care and so on, though extremely important, often goes ignored and underappreciated, as we all know. But things change when they work outside the home and bring back money that enhances family prosperity. Their standing within their household improves. Their voice in family decision making is amplified. In the wider community, they are exposed to new ideas and new people, and their social status rises. A 2013 UN Women's Report found that formal and semi-formal employment is more likely to contribute to women's ability to decide how to use their income, to make decisions about their own health, to gain respect within the community, to participate in politics, to express support for more equi equitable distribution of unpaid workloads, and in cultures characterized by son preference, less discriminatory attitudes towards daughters. Empowerment, however, is not just a social issue, but it is a huge economic issue. According to the IMF, in many developing countries, closing the gender gap in the labor market could raise the GDP by as much as 35%. Four-fifths of the gains would come from higher labor force participation, and the rest from productivity gains spurred by greater gender diversity. I still think about the McKinsey Global Institute report, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, from 2015, that estimated that accelerating progress towards gender equality in all regional labor markets would boost annual global economic output by something like $12 trillion 
within a decade, rising to as much as 28 trillion with full worldwide equality between women and men. These numbers cannot be taken for granted. The key takeaway is clear. The opportunity cost of gender inequality in the labor market, the economic gains we choose to forego by allowing these inequality to, equalities to persist are immense. They are in the same ballpark as the economic damage from the COVID-19 pandemic. The IMF estimated this year that the cumulative global output loss through 2024 compared to prior trend lines would be about $14 trillion. Despite the knowledge we have about the benefits of closing the gender gap, we are not doing enough. The World Economic Forum found that at the current rate of progress, it will take 132 years to close the current gender gap and 151 years to close the economic participation and opportunity gender gap. As United States Secretary General Antonio Guterres often puts it, and I quote, I cannot accept a world that tells my granddaughters that gender equality must wait for their granddaughters' granddaughters, <laughs> unquote. So we need to act, and we need to act fast. Doing more to empower women in the economy would boost growth when it is looking shaky. It would enhance purchasing power when it is being squeezed by inflation. And it would increase the supply capacity of economies at a time when we need massive investment push for a swift and just low carbon transition. In other words, it's a no brainer. Let me now turn to how trade can help. Simply put, trade generates more and better jobs and job opportunities for women. Two years ago, the WTO and the World Bank did a joint study on trade and gender equality. We found that companies that export employ more women. This means that women working in export sectors typically benefit from higher wages than their counterparts in non-export sectors, and a greater likelihood of having a formal job and the associated job security and training benefits. Let's look at some numbers. The huge increase in global trade in recent decades has been accompanied by a dramatic reduction in poverty. In 1980, over 40% of the world population lived on under the equivalent of $1.90 a day. By the eve of the pandemic, this share had fallen to less than a tenth. In developing countries and emerging markets, we find that firms that are integrated into global trade or global value chains have an average female labor force share of 37%, while firms that are not integrated into global value chains have an average female labor force share of 25%, much less. So when trade increases in firms, more women are employed. In countries such as Morocco, Romania, and Vietnam, women represent 50% or more of the workforce of exporting firms. For women working in sectors with low levels of exports comes with a one in five chance of informality with the vulnerabilities and risks that entails. In high export sectors, that falls to around one in eight. The study suggests that if developing countries double their manufacturing exports, a typical increase for developing countries that open themselves to trade, women would benefit from increased employment and higher salaries. This could push, push their share of total manufacturing wages from 24 to 30%. Trade liberalization also has disproportionate, disproportionate benefits for women as consumers. Compared with male-headed households, female-headed households tend to spend a larger share on food, which is usually subject to higher tariffs. For more than three quarters of a sample of 54 developing countries, Estimating, eliminating import tariffs would boost real incomes for female-headed households more than for households led by men. Trade-related jobs can also reshape educational and social incentives. Randomized controlled trials in North India showed that in villages with, where call centers recruited young women, families kept girls in school longer and fed them better. Despite the enormous gains on offer, a range of economic, social, and even legal barriers hold women back, both within domestic economies and in global markets. According to the World Bank's latest survey of women business and the law, in over a dozen countries, laws remain on the books that prohibit women from leaving home at will, 
or allow husbands to prevent their wives from working. Legal discrimination against women in the area of property ownership endures in 76 countries, denying women collateral for borrowing. This contributes to what the IFC estimates is a $1.7 trillion gender fin uh, trade finance gap, which reduces women's ability to start and grow businesses. Women traders report harassment at borders and with obtaining services and paperwork. Once inequalities in education and training are added to the mix, we see some unfortunate patterns. Women are overrepresented in low-skilled and informal jobs. In low-income countries, just 3% of female employees are skilled workers. Are skilled workers. In sub-Saharan Africa, 92% of wo working women are informally employed. Women run fewer and smaller businesses. Women own and manage only about a third of established businesses worldwide, according to the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. The businesses they run tend to be much smaller than those run by men. Women are one and a half times likelier than men to be running one-person shows, and two-thirds less likely to operate companies with over 20 employees. Smaller size means that fixed costs associated with trade, understanding target markets, finding potential partners, Navigating customs and regulatory procedures and so on all weigh more heavily on women entrepreneurs seeking to do business across borders. It also makes it harder to access straight finance, which remains skewed towards larger firms. Women-owned firms face 50% more rejections for their trade finance requests than men-owned firms. Once we take these factors together, it is not surprising that in 2020, the global rate of internationalization for women entrepreneurs at 5% was barely over half that of their male counterparts. By one estimate, 90% of exporting firms dealing with manufacturers are owned by men. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has made many of these gaps worse. Women's employment fell further and has been slower to recover, particularly outside high-income countries. The ILO reported in May that the global gender gap in hours worked had widened over the previous two years. Women and girls are likelier than men and boys to have dropped out of school, to have foregone work to care for others, or to, or to have reported an increase in gender-based violence. Women were overrepresented in the face-to-face -face services sector, such as food, tourism, and retail, that were among the most badly affected by COVID-19 and were likelier than men to report business closures. While the data is patchy, and this would be a good focus for any researchers here, the pandemic has dealt women significant setbacks in global trade. One estimate is that between 2019 and 2020, the pandemic widened the internationalization gender gap by 30%. Now, on the brighter side, the pandemic has revealed some silver linings, above all the shift to digital. As we all know, digital commerce boomed during the pandemic, and this was true just about everywhere. Total payment value for African e-commerce companies, for example, nearly doubled between the first half of 2019 and the first half of 2020, according to the UN Economic Commission for Africa. WTO data indicates that global exports of digitally delivered services grew 14% year-on-year in 2020 and 2021, and digital platforms are bringing in more women and small businesses to international trade. This brings me to my final point about what we can do. Making trade work better for women and girls requires action at multiple levels, including local and domestic. We're supporting women entrepreneurs. Improving access to finance and information is critical. But since this is UNGA week, I want to focus on the international dimension. Things are moving in the right direction at the WTO and elsewhere, but we need to do more to support women on two fronts. The first deals with targeted measures to benefit women and the businesses they own. This means scaling up supply-side support 
investing in trade to help women-owned businesses in developing countries overcome barriers, keeping them out of international markets. When, share, when I saw share butter producers in my country, Nigeria, being helped to meet international quality standards so they could break into overseas markets, into the US and the EU where they were kept out because of, of sanitary and phytosanitary measures. It was a joy to see how their incomes doubled and tripled in some cases. And they were, I spoke to them myself and saw what the WTO was doing with the International Trade Center, the ITC. They were now able to send their children to secondary school and even university, a couple of them said. And they were also able to start other businesses. When I see tech startups in Uganda that they can connect to potential investors, mentors, and cl clients, all this has the potential to catalyze the virtuous circles of international sales, higher earnings, more investment, and greater value addition. Research has shown that women who trade internationally can make more than two times the annual earnings of women in the same sector who only trade locally. However, as I said before, what these businesses often lack is the financing to scale up. In this decade, we have to make a concerted effort towards financing and upscaling women or women-led businesses in order to enable them to move into global value chain. There is also room to make trade policy itself more gender sensitive. A group of about three quarters of WTO members have been shining a spotlight on issues such as unequal access to trade finance to weak participation in public procurement. An informal working group on trade and gender at the WTO is seeking to shape future rulemaking in ways that close these gender gaps, and I'm very proud of the work they are doing. The ongoing WTO negotiations on e-commerce. Just to let you know, digital is booming, and the future of trade is digital, its services is green. But we don't have rules that underpin e-commerce. So we are negotiating these rules, and I'm very excited about it because agreeing on common global standards by which digital trade would uh, be conducted would reduce uncertainty and transactions costs that affect women-owned businesses and other smaller businesses. So even though it's benefiting uh, uh, globally, uh, WTO members, benefiting women and SMEs is particularly important. I hope that this e-commerce negotiations will conclude by the end of next year. So we'll have the rules that underpin global digital trade. Many trade agreements, including at the WTO, have also put, not put gender considerations as a priority. We are changing this. For the first time, the agreement on services domestic regulation, concluded by 67 WTO members in 2021, and now signed on to by 69 of them, includes a specific clause prohibiting discrimination between men and women in regulations governing who is authorized to provide service. This is a harbinger of the type of change we want to see and will try to bring in negotiating new agreements. But if we want to truly maximize trade's contribution to improving the lives of women and girls, we have to tackle the reality that many poor countries have been left out of the gains from trade and globalization these last few decades. These countries have registered some of the weakest performances on human development indicators, including in maternal and child health. The current rethink on supply chain resilience in the wake of COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine creates a window of opportunity to bring these four countries from the margins of the global economy to the mainstream. As more companies seek to diversify their supply chains to reduce ris risks and enhance resilience, the international community can help poor countries with good macroeconomic environments follow in the footsteps of Vietnam, Bangladesh, and Morocco and attract value chain investment. Expanding this process of what I call re-globalization, please note this word, I'm saying it everywhere, and I want it to become part of the vocabulary. It would, it, re-globalization would accomplish objectives that de-globalization cannot. Bringing in excluded parts of Africa, Asia, and Latin America 
into global production networks would boost growth and reduce poverty. It would create more chances, and this is why I'm so excited about it, for women-owned businesses and SMEs to tap into value chains. And finally, at a time when the world is grappling with more frequent exogenous shocks that we've all seen from the COVID shutdowns to floods in Pakistan, deeper and more diversified international markets would enhance supply resilience in a way that locally vulnerable national supply chains cannot. So what am I saying? We can use the opportunity of what we see now, the vulnerability in supply chains that are too concentrated in certain geographies to manage risk and build resilience for the world and diversify them into those countries that have been left out, the poorer countries where there are poor women, small businesses, who could benefit highly by being brought into regional and global value chains. Let's use this opportunity. Let's not waste a crisis, as Winston Churchill said. Let's use this opportunity to re-globalize, help women, help our girls, and help our poorer countries at the same time. We'll kill so many birds with one stone. Let me conclude by recalling Payang Salah's conviction that population policies are about people. They are about girls. They are about women. They are about improving their lives. I'll tell you that at the WTO, we also firmly believe that trade is about people and about improving lives. And I hope that will drive relentlessly towards using all the instruments we can to get the policies in place that benefit girls and women. Thank you. Thank Dr. Nkonjo Iwiala for her lecture. And let me just do a recap. I always find it helps, you know, with a, uh, after a lengthy uh, lecture. Uh, what is empowerment all about? Being able to choose and make decisions for yourself. I was on a panel earlier this week at the SDG moment with Melinda French Gates, and she said women don't need empowerment, women need power. And I think that that speaks to that point. Uh, global trade has been and remains a powerful instrument for improving the lives of girls and women around the world, and especially in poor countries. Empowering women economically through decent jobs and trade can lead to increased global development and economic growth. When women engage in paid work, it can be transformative for them, their families, and their communities, and for entire societies. Empowerment, however, is not just a social issue, but it is a huge, has a huge economic impact. According to the IMF, Closing the gender gap in the labor market could raise GDP by 35%. Accelerating progress towards gender equality in all regional labor markets would boost annual global economic output by something like 12 trillion within a decade. And to quote the SG, I cannot accept a world that tells my granddaughters that gender equality must wait for their granddaughters and granddaughters. So that's a little recap uh, for you. And as we now move to the second part of this lecture, we will see a short video about Mr. Salas, and I invite Dr. Nkonjo Iwiala to warm up her seat as we get into the second part. Let's play the video. we conceive population questions within the UN system, this con covers all the spectrum of what is known as population from demography and statistics to family planning.
And as you can see, the UNFPA that uh, Mr. Salas led for over 50 years ago has only grown in strength, building on that solid foundation and vision that he created. We move now into the moderated segment. And please have your questions ready, because we have about 30 minutes to get through this, and I really want to get to questions from the audience as well. Dr. Okonjo, we are, thank you for all of that. It's really inspiring, right? Uh, we've seen in recent years the political challenges countries can face when people feel and are left behind from globalization. Making the benefits of trade more inclusive will, of course, be central to correcting that. But how do we actually make it happen? And what are the risks to global trade agreements if we cannot share the fruits of development more broadly? Your microphone is there. Well, thank you very much, Sherwin. That is very much a central uh, issue that we, we have to grapple with. Like I said before, trade has helped lift over a billion people out of poverty. Um, and we shouldn't forget that. But it's absolutely also true that there were poor people within rich countries and poor countries who were left out. And so what we need to ask ourselves is, how can trade be made an instrument for inclusion? And that's really the question that I pose to myself. Uh, one of the things that attracted me to uh, go for the job of WTO DGs, when I looked at the purpose of the organization as laid out in the preamble for its creation, it said that the WTO's purpose is to enhance living standards to help create employment and to support sustainable development. What could be more interesting than that? It's all about people. And so I asked myself, if it's all about people, how do we also use this instrument then to do what you said? And that is why there are, things, there are two sets of things uh, that we need to do. And as I said, it's very opportune. We need to use global trade policy, but we also need supply side measures on the ground that can actually help people. Just on the supply side, the WTO has a sister organization called International Trade Center, uh, and it's 50% owned by WTO and 50% by UNCTAD. And its mission is indeed not just to stay at the level of trade policy, but to get down on the ground and discover those women and their enterprises who are women marginalized, small enterprises that cannot enter these value chains and ask why, what is impeding them? And many times you find they don't have, they don't meet the standards to be able to sell their products where they can make more money. They don't have access to market information. They need to build capacity. They don't have access to finance. So this organization, and I'm very proud of what they're doing, has been working quietly uh, and works quiet, quietly. So what can we do? We need to get on the ground where the people are and try to find out what is their problem. You know, before I, I, I took over the WTO, I didn't know they, what they were doing in Nigeria. And I, when I became the DG, then I met these groups of people with whom they've been working for years, five years, six years. This is not overnight work. To help them lift up the standards of their products so they can sell. So on the ground, and then in terms of policies, look at what I said. Now this conjuncture in the world provides a unique opportunity to use trade as an instrument to lift countries, bring them in. As I said in my lecture, we've now seen that we need to diversify supply chains. I joke very much now that before nobody knew or cared about supply chains. Now all of us, it's dinner table conversation. <laughs> You know, so supply chains are too concentrated. And we need to diversify them. And we should use this as an opportunity. So if we can persuade com companies, businesses, to diversify what they're doing into those countries where we need to create employment, we need to get women into the global value chain, where we need to create opportunities for girls, this would be part of the way that we can use trade to bring people into the global mainstream where their lives can improve. I mean, is that what you mean when you talk about re-globalization? Is that exactly. precisely what you're talking about, right? That's precisely what I'm talking about. So instead of saying you're going to French shore or re-shore, 
supply chains, meaning you want to bring them home because you think that's the best thing to protect yourself or bring them to friendly countries. The U.S. wants to bring supply chains here and is prepared to subsidize some companies to do that, like chips or place them in Europe. Why don't you think of other countries? Why don't you think of Ethiopia? Think of uh, Morocco, Tunisia, all these places. Cambodia, Laos are already benefiting from it. That's what I mean. And that's how we can include those who have not been included and help them trade more, add value to their products and trade more. It also sounds like this re-globalization is a ground up initiative rather than a top-down initiative. You're talking about going to these countries, understanding what it is that women on the ground require, and then building policy around that. Am I right? It's both. So it, it's uh, businesses have to make that decision, but governments can help shape that decision as they are shaping their decisions now. But at the same time, you have to couple it with actions on the ground to help uh, uh, the women solve some of the critical issues standing in their way of benefiting from this. All right, I'm going to come to questions after this one, all right, so stand by. Dr. Okonje Weale, your lecture focused on the impact of trade on women and girls, which are the ones who also bear the brunt of economic dislocation and climate change impacts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if one country sets higher climate action standards than others, there is, of course, the risk that they become less competitive. So how do you ensure that trade takes place on a level playing feed field uh, with regard to climate action, but in ways that are green and carbon neutral, right? That's a huge question. <laughs> well, you're the, bo you're the boss. So. Yes, and that's the question of the time. No, I, I welcome that question, because I think that trade, the future of trade is green. And if we don't learn now that trade has to contribute to solving the climate uh, change problem we are in, and stop being seen as part of the problem. You know, when you talk about trade, people typically think trade is part of the problem because it contributes the logistics of trade, for instance, contribute to carbon emissions, shipping, aviation, etc., and also the way certain products are made. If it leads to deforestation because you want to grow palm oil, then and trade that is that contributing to the more carbon emissions? So that's the mindset. And we want to change that mindset to also think that trade can be part of the solution. So yes, uh, trade can help us as a tool for adaptation. Just think about it. Climate change is so evident, evidently with us now. And you don't know what's going to happen. Nobody knew one third of uh, Pakistan would be underwater or that they would lose 80% of the crops in their breadbasket. Nobody knew all these fires in California and Australia would happen. And the droughts in the Sahel and, and the Horn of Africa. So if we continue having these events, you need a tool that will enable you in the short term get goods, be it food or whatever, from places where they, they have them in abundance to where it is lacking. Pakistan is now saying we have to buy food from India when they were really a net exporter of food. Mm. That's trade. Trade also helps to propagate technologies, tools, and equipment that you need to build back to adapt to climate change. So this is what I see as the future of trade that we need to emphasize. Trade as a tool for adaptation. Trade as a tool for building resilience. That's what being part of the solution is, and that's what WTO members are now beginning to focus on. How do we do that? And how do we make rules that support this vision? Now, we also have the issue of decarbonization coming from another angle, where we have different jurisdictions putting in carbon border adjustment mechanisms and measures. We have 70 fragmented approaches to carbon taxation and pricing now, 70. And this approach will lead to trade frictions if we don't try to develop a common approach. Because if the EU says we are putting in carbon border, border adjustment measures, which we have no problems with, can be compatible with WTO rules. But when it comes to implementation, how do you measure the amount of carbon in a product so that you can judge equivalency? Mm. This will lead to frictions that will end up at the WTO's dispute settlement system. 
So we want to decarbonize, but can we develop a methodology of a common global carbon pricing approach? That's something we are working on with the IMF and the OECD to see if we can develop a common approach, benchmarking low-income countries, middle-income and high-income along, along the same spectrum. That way we'll all be talking the same thing and it will lead to less friction. Okay, that's our segue. Trade as a tool for adaptation and resilience. Now show me your hands. Who would like to go first? All right, lady at the back, blonde hair. You were first, so, you know, call it like you see it. My name is Judith Bruce Popper, and I'm long admired your work and that of UNFPA. Um, we've all been concerned, as Salas was, of capturing and creating the demographic dividend. You began your talk by speaking about the importance of redistribu redistributing the uh, dependency burden, and I know from other interactions with you um, that you're very aware that women and girl, well, women's economic, in, women's income is 10 to 20 times more valuable in terms of direct investment than males. What tools do you have at your disposal? You've spoken about the supply side to capture for women employees and you know, garment workers and so forth uh, and entrepreneurs a higher proportion of what they earn under their control, worksite savings mechanisms, child savings accounts sponsored by employers, remittance policy, uh, financial literacy, in very young ages, I think Nigeria taught me some of the most important lessons about very economically conscious women and girls. But what on the other side, while we wait for this expansion, can we do to maximize the income under their hands? Well, thank you. You know, what, what, um, what you're speaking about, you know, cannot be approached by one set of policies alone. I think we need a basket of tools in order to be able to do that. Um, and, and so we need to look at the whole spectrum from creating opportunities for women, and in some cases to legislating. Um, I have to say that some of the things we want to happen to open up opportunities for women to be able to earn more and keep more of what they earn. We can preach and preach. Sometimes it may not happen. We may have to take action, uh, which means that we direct that certain openings be made for them in certain areas and professions. Um, we may need to have legislation that helps get things done to make sure that women are able to access these opportunities and keep what they earn. So we, it's, it's both from that point of view as well as the values and educating and changing social point of view. But that will take time. So in the meantime, what do you do? You may have to use, as I said, instruments that open the way. So a bunch of social policies, a bunch of legal policies, and sometimes we may have to ask men to step aside and get out of the way as well. <laughs> you know, so that is part of creating the space and the opportunity. Hi, Dr. Ngozi, it's Gita Pravgupta. Hi, Gita, wow. Pleasure, pleasure <laughs> to see, hear you speak yeah. and to hear about your positive vision. Um, I love the concepts that you introduced. I have this pessimism about how you're going to make this happen given the political interests that are so narrow and so nationalist driven. There are political barriers to making some of what you say happen. And you know, I, I love the evidence you present. It's evidence that we've known forever about how empowering women economically benefits all. It's never been sufficient to change minds. So what is it what is it that will help in the negotiations that you do between countries to make the larger countries realize that the poorer countries can be the ones to provide the supplies, can develop the stronger supply chains? That's, it's a political argument that we need, and I'm not quite sure what that is, and I'd love your insights into that. Well, I'll try. As you said at the WTO, it's politically very difficult because people have been locked in a battle of, an, of mistrust of each other. 
So it's been very difficult to move negotiations. And the truth is developing countries who feel they were not at the table when some of the rules were made that drive global trade today, they were not there at the table. I saying we are now here and you've got to take our issues into account. And developed countries are saying, okay, we are not there, but we want to move on and we want to move on to these issues. That results a bit in a dialogue of the deaf. And, and, and you know, in, in gridlock. So at WTO, a lot of things were gridlocked. It was taking 20 years to negotiate an agreement on fishery subsidies that supports sustainability. Why would we be doing that? So when I came, I asked, are we waiting till the, we are now 50% overfished stocks. Practically, is it when we are 70% or when there is nothing that will get agreement? But it's some of that, of that underlying political tension that also inhibits movement on women and on creating the space for them to be recognized specifically in the rules of trade. So it's not changing, it's changing, not as fast as we would like it. But the fact that 123 WTO members signed on to an agreement that they want to change the way we look at rulemaking to make it more gender specific in trade says a lot to me. So the dialogue has begun. We've done one, one agreement has inserted specifically a, a, a rule against discriminating against women. That's a big change from not doing anything. So what I'm saying is, it's picking up, Gita, we are all as frustrated about the time it's going to take, or it's taking, and we want to move faster. But I think we've got to keep pushing, not give up, you know, take it step by step. Suddenly you start and there's an avalanche. When I got to the WTO, I never knew we could even break through these deadlocks that have been there for dec two decades or more. But what happened? Even on vaccines, the TRIPS waiver, Argument going on for three years. With determination, we, the members did the impossible. We were able to have a successful multilateral negotiations with more than six agreements with Russia, Ukraine, the US, and China around the same table. The only organization that has been able to do that so far. I'm telling you this so to say I never give up. Yeah. We must push. I would just add that you know, what happened is they appointed a woman to lead. Um, <laughs> and I think just to develop Gita's question there, it, it's, it's this notion of this consensus-driven approach that I think we don't talk enough about in these multilateral fora, whether at the UN, whether at the WTO, the World Health Organization. The ability of us all to agree on how we move forward is often a stumbling block, block in and of itself. One country essentially can block, block the progress of the collective. Is that not problematic moving forward? Absolutely. <laughs> It would have been easier to have a system you know, in which you could vote and then the majority carries the vote. But that's not the multilateral governance that was put in place. So we have what we have. And when you step back and think about it, what this system does, frustrating as it is, it gives every single country a voice. Because in the WTO, a small country can hold up everything. And they almost did. We had just finished almost inking the, uh, dotting the I's and T's on the fisheries subsidies agreement in June, when, uh, during the minister, when the Pacific Islands as a group got together and said, we don't like it, and they blocked it. And, but then we kept them for 48 hours, all the ministers, and said, I said they couldn't go until we got some agreements, <laughs> and we just kept feeding them coffee and sandwiches. <laughs> But that's to show you that Palau has as much power as the United States. So that is why, as frustrating as it is, the fact that a country, a small country, has a voice is something beautiful. And it gives developing countries at least the sense that they can affect what happens to them. It leads to a lot of gridlock. But when I get frustrated, I have to sing myself this song about how beautiful it is that we can be held up by a very small country with 30,000 people. We just need to put some music to those words. <laughs> Next hand, please. Question from the floor. I saw, right, lady, please. Yeah. 
microphone, and then I'll come to the back. That was definitely not singing. Thank you, uh, Catherine Zapolna, a former member of the Irish government. And may I first say, I want to thank you for your extraordinary relational leadership. And I think that has something to do with answering your question, which is what you've really been describing, is, is, is that in order to move forward, and I, I know how difficult negotiations can be, but if it's rooted in someone who believes in and exemplifies a relational form of re leadership, that will help move things forward, get through those deadlocks. And that's what you, you, you the way you began your lecture, um, a, a, a acknowledging the relationship relationships from which you're a part and, and continuing to do that throughout and the way in which you uh, combine reference to people as much as your numbers. So this is so critical and, and it gives me great hope that you are the leader uh, in world, the World Trade Organization, if I may say. And then the other thing I wanted to uh, comment on, I suppose, uh, is, is although it is a piece of evidence, uh, again, in relation to that last question, uh, earlier this week, uh, the Global Food Security Index was launched. It's in its 11th year, uh, as, as you probably know. The Economist designed it many years ago. A global agricultural uh, company, a Corteva, supported it. And what it found was that though it, global food security increased between 2012 and 2015 significantly, it's now gone down over the last three years. And you might say, why is that? Because of the shocks of COVID or conflict um, uh, or climate. But actually what it's demonstrating is that the food security environment is de de um, declining or deteriorating because of the systems and the structures that haven't been reformed significantly enough, which makes us more vulnerable to the shocks. And one of the other things, just to connect it with what you're saying here, is that those countries that went up in terms of their scores were because they were supporting um, the empowerment which of, of women farmers by 18% and empowerment leads to women in power. So th that is another piece of significant evidence this week. That's a very powerful statement. And you've hit on something that we've not done well. We didn't get at this last ministerial at the WTO. The WTO members, the global negotiations on agriculture and reforming agriculture are being done at the WTO. But for the past two decades, there's been no breakthrough in how do we agree the global rules for trade in agriculture. It is so contentious. It is so emotional. Every government has skin in the game, and they all have their different hobby horses. The Indians are interested in pub uh, public stock holding. How do you develop adequate stocks, given that they have 1.4 billion people to feed. What rules underpin that are you allowed to subsidize if you want to stock? A group of countries called the Keynes Group are interested in the fact that subsidization of agriculture, which is leading to unfair competition in the world, has reached, we're at $817 billion now in subsidies and we will reach a trillion by 2030. And it is the rich countries subsidizing. Not only them, but much of the subsidies is coming. Emerging markets are joining the game. So how do poor countries compete in this atmosphere? And then you've got a third group like the US, which is interested in market access. So with all these disconnects, we are not able to bring them together. So we are going to try for a refresh, but you're absolutely right. If we don't reform the rules of the game for agriculture, it's also going to hold us back some in the global food security. So that's another fight we're having. I'm gonna take one more question from the back. We have less than 10 minutes left. Let's see, see I'll try. Maybe just a question. Thank you, it's uh, Vivian from UNFPA. I'm uh, so excited today that uh, the productive and the reproductive issue finally merged together, being discussed together. So my question is more about uh, the W uh, World Trade Policy, how that can not only encourage women to participate in economic activities, but also taking care of their reproductive needs and choice. What I then mean that how to encourage employer or the trade to have a policy that is more balanced of 
work and the life production and the reproduction. So it's just so relevant to us. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very, very interesting uh, question. And I don't want to overreach on what the WTO can deliver uh, because it focuses on the economic aspects. But one thing is clear, that the evidence is very clear, and the econometric studies have been done on this. Once women have more agents, uh, have, uh, more, um, uh, are more empowered in their work and their economic life, they tend to also have more agency over their bodies and what they do and their reproductive health and, and life. So that's one way of getting at it. You know, so we can't go to the reproductive end, but we can certainly go to the economic end to see how do we make women uh, be stronger economically because all the studies show, the evidence shows that this leads to a whole slew of things, including having more say mm. in what happens to their reproductive health. So that's the, the only way we can get at it. Yeah, it's getting back to that question of power. Okay, Rivka, one question quickly. I see her in social circles, so I'm, you know, just protecting myself. It's a South African solidarity. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the final question. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ngozi. Rivka Jaffe from the International Trade Center. Great to see you, and thank you for your kind words of support for the ITC. Uh, what you've speak, spoken about mainly is, is the laws that govern international trade and the policies that governments need to do. But we know that companies trade. So what message do you have as head of the WTO for companies that do business so that women and girls can benefit more from international trade? Well, um, I don't even have to have words for them. <laughs> I think we just need to show them. There's so much overwhelming evidence now, and this is what we say to business in the sense that you need to ask yourself, what are you missing? What's the opportunity cost of not having a diverse work workforce, which includes women? What's the opportunity cost of not linking with those small uh, entrepreneurs uh, who can make and manufacture some of the things in your global value chain? Um, so I think it's evidence-based we can preach to them um, but there's so much evidence of what could happen with the economics of their firms and their production. And I think many of them are coming to see it. After all, you go to Bangladesh and garment workers there are overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly women. You go to Vietnam, Morocco, 50% of women in, tr in exporting industries are women. So there must be a reason they are finding that maybe women are more, uh, what do you call it, more skilled, more persistent, more reliable, more whatever else you want to call it. So we are seeing it happen now in, com in companies that more and more women are being employed in these exporting sectors. So I'd rather go with evidence, and this is what I say when I talk to businesses. The evidence is in front of you uh, that it would benefit your business if you paid attention to making sure your workforce is diversified and women make up a strong part of it. I'm going to give you one last opportunity to wrap for us, Dr. Ngozi. Um, just a final thought from you. Well, uh, my final thought is really what uh, to say, go back to the reason for this lecture and uh, to say that um, well, watching uh, what uh, Mr. Rafael Salas was able to do and inspiration. I just saw those people standing up, uh, um, was it in Nairobi? No, not Nairobi, but, uh, the, hmm? Yeah, and it just, it just raised a picture in my mind of how one person, one person can so inspire and lead and make change. And the thought I have is, Let's be accountable for the change that we seek. It begins with me. So I always ask myself, you want to change this? What can you as an individual do about it? We often think that, we are, oh, who are we? We are so small, we cannot make change. 
But you would be amazed one pers what one person can sometimes do. And if you even succeed as a person in changing one other person's life, that is huge. So my thought is, let us be agents for the change that we are seeking, the same way that Mr. Rafael Salas was. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwiala. <laughs> Dr. Kanem, a final word from you, please. Thank you. I'll just sit here. Well, Dr. Ngozi, you have provided us with a thoughtful lecture casting light on the role of trade in increasing the power and agency of women and girls, and we would like to thank you. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today as well, with a special thanks to Her Royal Highness, the Crown Princess for making time to be with us today, and to Ambassador Menchu Salas for keeping Mr. Salas's legacy alive. I would also like to say a word of thanks to our fantastic UNFPA worldwide team. And in fact, a number of our retired alums are with us here and online. Sherwin Bryce Pease, once again, you've done it again. Uh, your adept moderation really helps us to probe deeper. I think we've had a lively discussion and certainly great questions. And in particular, we appreciate that in your analytical journalism, you're always a champion of women and girls, of leaving no one behind. And we've all claimed those 17 sustainable development goals that tell us that we do need to do much more and hopefully faster as 2030 approaches. And just as Raphael Salas spanned the globe to forge consensus on population and development, we now rejoin that spirit of common purpose. Let us work together to create economies that work for everyone, that work for all people, not just a few, and let us prioritize women and girls so that the power and the opportunities to determine the course of their own lives can contribute to transformation of communities at the base, which leads to transformation of countries and certainly our world. And I think, Dr. Ngozi, you've shared your vision. And we've seen that you do have the intellect, the negotiation skills, the power of the facts at your command, and we pledge to support you as you advocate for re-globalization. And also, we pledge to hold leaders accountable, to hold them accountable in WTO, in the world uh, multilateral system, so that women and girls do stand at the center of development everywhere. The proverb tells us, depend upon one to count to two. It is an interconnected world. But we're each much more than a number. The human family is much more than a number. So it is my hope that as we approach a world of eight billion, we will have infinite possibilities to uphold individual rights and choices, to offer possibilities for people, for societies, and for our shared planet to thrive and to prosper. Thank you very much indeed. I thank Dr. Kanem for those warm closing remarks, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us today for the 18th Raphael, uh, Raphael M. Salas Memorial Lecture. And to quote the first woman and African Director General of the World Trade Organization, Let's be accountable for the change that we seek. Thank you. Thank you.